Thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction, and thank you, Esper, for the invitation. It's my first time to this meeting, and also first time in Brazil, so I'm very happy and I'm enjoying it a lot. So thank you again. <coughs> so as Ricardo introduced, I'm going to <coughs> give you some update on some intervention that we are doing in the lab to target inflammation and viral persistence and using the monkey model of HIV infection. And uh, as you all know, the impact of antiretroviral therapy has been amazing in the context of HIV infection with a big impact on morbidity and mortality. However, there is still at least two important implications and uh, issues even in people that adhere well to antiretroviral therapy and this, uh, the persistence of immune dysfunction and also the persistence of a viral reservoir. Uh, and uh, we believe that these two uh, issues are actually uh, tightly connected between them and that is uh, we curing HIV infections, but the virological and immunological problem. Theoretically, it is possible that even if we have an intervention that will uh, cure, even take away the, the only copy of the virus, so we still may not have a cure if we are not able to regenerate a proper uh, immune system. So in our lab, we try to basically target this two uh, issue on uh, patient in antiretroviral therapy. And as I said, we do using the monkey model of SV infection and uh, the rhesus macaques, and this slide summarizes the main um, advantage of this model, in particular in the context of HIV research. And some of these advantages include the ability that we can control for many clinical parameters some of those are indicated in the slide that are very difficult to control in humans. We can interrupt antiretroviral therapy for prolonged periods without having an ethical issue to restart antiretroviral therapy if the virus rebound. And very important in a reservoir study, we can perform longitudinal collection in multiple anatomic locations. We do uh, rectal biopsy, lymph node, blood, and bone marrow collection longitudinal in our animals. And of course, we can sacrifice the animal on antiretroviral therapy and look for the virus in many other anatomical locations. And again, being a, a model, in um, preclinical model, give us the possibility to test novel and risk intervention for HIV eradication. Some of those I will present later in the talk. So what we've been working in the past five, six years is to basically focus in trying to define a potential mechanism uh, involved in uh, the residual inflammation and also in HIV persistence during antiretroviral therapy, and then to try to design immunomodulatory intervention that can impact on this target. And again, when we do some in vivo study, then it's informative to <coughs> go back to try to understand what is the real mechanism involved in this. And uh, some of the um, major mechanisms that we've been studying is uh, uh, the compromised gut integrity during HIV infection, the suboptimal antiviral response, upregulation of conhibitor receptor, persistence of interleukin 10 signal, and as uh, Michael showed yesterday, the uh, aggressive of cytolytic cells from site of viral persistence. And some of the intervention that we've been performing try to uh, address this uh, issue is uh, um, treated animal with interleukin-21, that as I will show you, is important to improve the gut integrity. Uh, a combined intervention, interleukin-21 plus interferon that I'm going to show today, with the idea to also increase the antiviral immune response, and also a multiple checkpoint blockade that is a study that I'm going to present and is uh, ongoing to try to um, target the conhibitor receptor. And there is other interventions that are ongoing in the lab, but I'm not going to cover today. So I said all the good things about the monkey model. One main uh, problem in the context of HIV cure was that until several years ago, we don't have uh, antiretroviral therapy as effective as in human to block viral replication, so making it more difficult to perform reservoir study. So in the past three, four years, study from uh, many labs, including ours, and led by Jeff Lifson at uh, NCI, optimize a uh, now very effective antiretroviral therapy. Uh, in particular, is a combination of TDF, FTC, and DTG that we can combine together with a single injection formulation and give to the animal. And uh, only in my lab, we have more than uh, and the third is in fact the rhizomacacs on antiretroviral therapy, and we now uh, regularly achieve a very good uh, viral suppression in basically 
like 99% of the animal. And it's very variable how long it takes, depending on how high is the variable to start with, but uh, if you treat long enough, basically we are able to get these animal undetectables. So, as I said, one of the main focus in our lab was the um, problem of the loss of gut integrity in HIV-infected patients. And we and our lab have shown that uh, there is uh, some important cells for the gut integrity called T17 cells that are actually preferentially depleted both in pathogenic HIV and HIV infection, but they are not depleted, they are preserved in non-progressive infection, including in human, in long-term non-progressive, and also in monkey model, natural lost for SAV that do not progress to it. Uh, as uh, Tom Wu presented this meeting, these cells are not only depleted in the chronic infection, but are infected very, very early after vaginal transmission. And uh, we and others have also shown that the depletion of these cells is associated, ag again, with loss of mucosal integrity, chronic immune activation, and disease progression. And not only these cells are depleted, but they also lost function. And uh, we have shown this in monkey. There is another paper that shows this in human. And it's also very difficult to recover these T17 cells with antiretroviral therapy. They tend to go um, to increase with many years of heart, but they never go back to pre-infection uh, level. And only when art is initiated very early on, there is a more impact on T17 cells that, that seems to be associated with uh, a, a low level of residual inflammation during antiretroviral therapy. So all this point make to us the key message that T17 cells are important for gut integrity and for reducing inflammation. So several years ago, we asked the question if we can try to preserve these T17 cells in the pathogenic model of HIV infection or macaques and to see what happens if you are able to do that. So we focus on this cytokine called interleukin-21. This is a cytokine that is mainly produced by CD40 cells and then KT cells. And this is interesting in the context of HIV infection for two main reasons. One is that it is important for the CD8 and NK cell function. IL-21 improves the cytotoxicity capacity of these cells. Indeed, there's been in uh, evaluation in clinical trials for multiple myeloma and renal cell carcinoma. Again, with the idea that you improve the ability of CD8 and NK cells to target the tumor cells. And for us, the main point of interest was that uh, uh, interleukin-21 is a, a cytokine very important for the differentiation and survival of T17 cells, the cells that we want to target. And again, there's been several studies showing that in the absence of IL-21, the generation and maintenance of T17 cells is indeed compromised. So I'm going to summarize in just this slide several work that's been done, that has been ongoing in our lab in the past several years. So we first show that provide the rationale for the work that I'm going to show now. So we first show that if you take the gut mucose of these sv infected macaques, no antiretroviral therapy here. There is a very strong association between how much IL-21 you have and how many T17 cells you have. So confirming the, connect, the association between IL-21 and T17 survival. We also performed in 2014 a proof of concept study in which we treated uh, SV infected macaques very early on after infection. So again, no antiretroviral therapy here with IL-21 and we proved that indeed we were able to preserve T17 cells and these reduce microbial translocation. And the more recent in collaboration with Jason Branch, we also perform his lab, perform a study in which we combine interleukin-21 with probiotic, and again, these improve T17 cells, reduce microbial translocation, and dysbiosis. So again, consistent with the idea that with T21, you can improve T17 cells and mucosal function. So with all this work, we thought that was uh, that there was uh, a rationale to test now IL-21 in the context of antiretroviral therapy. So I'm going to show you some of this data. So this is the fraction of these cells, T17 cells, in the rectal biopsy of our animal. This is before infection, and this is a few months after a severe infection. And the black are the control, and the orange are the animal that will receive interleukin 21. So until here, there is no any treatment. As you can see, these cells are depleted, as we and others have shown many times. So then we start seven months of antiretroviral therapy, here indicated by the gray box, 
And if you focus on the control in black, you can see that we have a very minimal recovery of T17 cells. As I said, also in human, recovery of these cells take a long time on antiretroviral therapy. However, in the treated animal that receive interleukin-21, the level of T17 cells go back right away at the level that we are no longer different from an infected animal. And you can see also this in the representative staining. And uh, I'm not going through the detail. This study has been... It's not working well. <coughs> okay. There is one... There's one picture that is not showing up, but we, we show in this manuscript in JCI that, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be one picture there, but it's not coming out, that um, we improve also the um, gut integrity by staining of LPS directly in site and also by staining with uh, a MPO, that is a surrogate marker of uh, um, integrity of the epithelium. When there is damage in the epithelium, you have a translocation of micro, uh, microbes and you have basically neutrophil that go there and produce MPO. So in that paper, we also showed that by improving t cells, we improve the integrity of the gut epithelium. And by improving the integrity of the gut epithelium, we were able to significantly reduce the level of residual inflammation. So here I'm showing the level of CD40 cells. On the left are CD80 cells, on the right that express the activation marker HLADR and CD38. So, and again, is in rectal biopsy. If you focus in the control, again, pre-art and three different endpoints of antiretroviral therapy. So the level of immunotivation goes down during antiretroviral therapy. However, if you focus on the animal that received IL-21, the level of inflammation goes down much faster and more significantly up to the latest endpoint on antiretroviral therapy. So by improving gut integrity, we are able to reduce residual inflammation. And uh, I'm not showing the data, but we found exactly the same result also in blood T cells and also for KI67, a marker of cycling cells. So we then ask, so we are now in a situation in which you have lower inflammation uh, at heart interruption. So we decided to stop antiretroviral therapy and ask the question if by reducing inflammation we have an impact on viral rebound. As uh, you saw today by David Walkins' talk, we are using the SV mac 39 so it's a very pathogenic virus. As David was pointing out, it's very difficult to protect with vaccine from this virus. The same thing is for our model, it's very difficult to impact on viral rebound with this uh, very pathogenic virus. But we ask the question anyway, so we have less inflammation, we stop part, do we have any impact on viral rebound? And the response was no. As you see, at the both animal rebound without any um, significant delay for the animal to receive the ILTNT1 during art. And despite that we are 0.7 log lower as a plasma varimia, there was no significant difference. So no significant difference in time to rebound and no significant difference in the set point viral load uh, during the um, uh, eight months we follow this animal after art interruption. So based on that, we decide to move to a next step in which we tested now a combined intervention. So the idea is again that during antiretroviral therapy, there is tumor problem, too much immune dysfunction, including inflammation and poor antiviral function. And these, uh, we think, contribute to the persistence of the reservoir. So we now have an intervention, interleukin-21, that has been able to significantly reduce inflammation. So we want now to combine it with an intervention that can improve the antiviral function. So we are performing a study in which we combine interleukin-21 with interferon alpha. And this is the design. We, in fact, had the seven control and 14 animals that then will be treated. All of them start antiretroviral, and again, this is the pathogenic virus. All of them start antiretroviral therapy at five weeks after, after infection. And uh, they received the IL-21 as we have done in the GCI paper. So at the beginning of art and later on to reduce inflammation. And uh, before stopping guard, they are also receiving interferon alpha with the idea to now improve antiviral function. And uh, the rationale to introduce interferon alpha comes from several papers. And the, uh, I'm showing four of these in which people that have uh, hepatitis C infection and HIV infection, so infected patients that have been treated with interferon in the context of 
uh, hepatitis C infection have uh, showing some impact on the HIV DNA level or in the HIV replication level. So the impact is not great, it's not very consistent in all this study, some is more, some is less, but there is some reduction in HIV DNA content. Um, this is just to show the plasma viral load of this animal. As I said, when we start, until they have a very high viral load to start with. So they peak between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8, a set point between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7. So very high. We start antiretroviral therapy, they became undetectable. <coughs> and the other important point that I want to show is that uh, uh, this is a longitudinal animal in which we look by RNA seq the level of multiple interferon stimulated genes. So these genes are low before infection, as expected, because there is an infection, they are highly increased at day 60 before art initiation. And, uh, but then when we go to check in antiretroviral therapy, two months, four months after art initiation, the majority of these genes are back to basically a baseline level, pre-infection level. So if you think that it's important to have some of these genes upregulated to maximize the antiviral function, uh, you need to treat with interferon because antiretroviral therapy will bring this gene, the expression of these genes down. And we also show that the interferon that we are using is biologically active in the animal that to receive it. So this we isolate the cells uh, two days after giving the interferon to the animal. And again, the large majority of interferon stimulated genes are upregulated. So, um, so these pictures are coming up nice, but I hope you can see. So the rationale for us to use uh, before IL-21 and then interferon was that, so interferon may have also a negative pro-inflammatory effect. There are clinical trials in human HIV infected patients, both giving interferon or blocking interferon. Um, so our rationale is that we know from the previous study that with uh, IL-21 we can reduce inflammation. So we hope that that is the best scenario to use interferon when inflammation is already down. That should uh, minimize his potential negative effect by and hopefully increase his, uh, maximize his potential beneficial antiviral effect. So again, we are confirming exactly the same result of the GSA paper. The animal that received IL-21 have a much more significant and faster reduction in multiple markers of T-cell immunoactivation, both in blood in the top and in the rectal biopsy. And this is CD4 on the left and CD8 on the right. So first message, we reduce inflammation again, as we showed in the previous study with IL-21. And second important message, when we treated with interferon alpha, there was no uh, negative impact on the uh, level of immunotivation. So we don't have, at least after IL-21 treatment, interferon alpha has not resulted in loss of CD4 cells. I'm not showing this data, loss of CD8 function or increased immunotivation. So we then ask, we were able to reduce inflammation with only L21, so the main reason to add uh, interferon was to see if we have an impact on also on viral persistence. So, and this is an ongoing study, so I still have many data need to be generated, but I'm showing what we have. So this is the level of SVDNA in the rectal biopsy C40 cells. And as Brad pointed out, this is a total SVDNA, so including the defective virus. And this is before art initiation, so you can see very similar level to start with. And this is the only time point we have for now after the animal receive IL-21 and interferon alpha. And there is a significant lower level of SVDNA in the treated animal, both at this time point and also if you consider the decay from the pre-art to on-art. So we have um, a significant reduction, increased reduction in the level of thin content in the rectal biopsy by reducing inflammation and treated with interferon alpha. So we also perform at the same time points, but now we are in the lymph node because as Brad pointed out, you need a lot of cells to do this QVO assay, so we don't have enough cells from the gut because we did not sacrifice the animal here. This is just a biopsy. So we perform a QVO assay in the lymph node from the same animal, and we don't have all the animal yet, but again, for now, it seems to be very clear that we also reduce by treating with interleukin-21 interferon the frequency of cells that are replication competent virus. So the key B in, in the previous talk. Uh, and I said, the additional analysis are ongoing. So, by reducing inflammation, 
We, so we have, we have now a situation which animals have low level of inflammation and also a lower size of the reservoir, including the replication competent virus during antiretroviral therapy. So we now ask the question, and we are in the phase two of the study, so we're now asking the question, if we stop antiretroviral therapy now with less inflammation and less size of the reservoir, do we impact on viral rebound? And it's important to note that we, in this phase two, we stop ART, but the animals are still receiving interferon alpha. And the rationale for that was with the idea that uh, interferon alpha is an antiviral, but of course is not as effective of as antiretroviral therapy. So we hope that we have a slower uh, um, rebound of the virus um, due to the lower reservoir to the interferon and that will allow the immune system now to see the virus because it's not going immediately to 10 to the 6 copies. So give time to the immune system, a window of opportunity to generate a strong antiviral immune response, in particular in the condition in which we have less inflammation that now can target the rebounding virus. And then later on, we also stop interferon as if that is enough to control this viral rebound. So phase two, we stop antiretroviral therapy, and uh, I need to point out that this phase has been done only in some of the animals, so this is now going to be five control and eight animals that receive IL-21 and interferon alpha. So when we stop antiretroviral therapy, we saw that at day nine, post heart interruption, as I said, this is very pathogenic virus, so five out of five controls already rebounded at day nine post heart interruption. But zero out of eight of the treated animal rebounded day nine. So two out of eight rebounded day 13. At day 20 post, post heart interruption, we have now seven out of eight rebound. And the last one rebounded day 51. So there is a limited in time, but statistically significant delay in viral rebound after heart interruption. And this graph shows the same results. So this is basically now all the animal. You can see they nine, all the five control rebound, what they control no, they treated animal no, and then they start to rebound between day 13, day 20, and later on. So not only there is a delay, but if you calculate the, um, the viral load that basically rebound the, after heart interruption, there is also a 1.3 log difference in the slope between day 6 and day 44. So there is in delay in viral rebound, limited in time, and uh, more than one log reduction in uh, viral load. And uh, I don't know if this is, a, of course, two weeks delay is not clinically relevant in human at least in my opinion. I think it's very bio biological relevant because again, this is a different model to impact in viral rebound. So we hope that that rebound will result in a big impact on the reservoir in this first phase of heart interruption. We still need to generate those data. So I'm um, showing a commentary. There's been two papers in Journal of Clinical Investigation uh, about one year ago in which actually, this is the humanized mice. They've done the other strategy. They actually block interferon with uh, an antibody. And they showed that there was a one week delay in viral rebound. As you can see, then the animal basically, there were no more any difference in viral load. And there was actually a lot of uh, enthusiasm with this strategy, with the commentary written by Steve Dix and Rafik Sekali on basically the interferon paradox. And I guess we are adding a piece to the paradox in a way that by actually providing interferon, we're able to generate a delay in viral rebound and also a lower, one log lower set point viral load. As I said, it's important to remember that these data are still at phase two when the animal are treated with interferon. So now we are moving in phase three in which also interferon is going to be interrupted. So these animals no longer are on art and no longer are interferon. So the idea is that by, again, reducing inflammation, less reservoir, having less viral load in the first six weeks after art interruption will have allowed the immune system to now better control for long term this virus. So we went back two months after the last dose of interferon, and four months after. And as you may guess, because we already were having few impact at day 44, what happened is that when we go back and they, at two months and four months after, there is no any more impact. So the animals that received the IL-21 and interferon are now no longer uh, distinguishable from the controls. So whatever we did, including reducing inflammation, size of the reservoir on art, delay in viral rebound, was not enough to have a long-term impact on the control of this virus. And uh, we are still, as I said, measuring viral persistence after heart interruption. We should have this data in the next few weeks. 
So in conclusion for this part, the combined interleukin-21 and interferon treatment reducing, uh, result in reduced mucosal and systemic immunization, so that was a very strong impact and very consistent with the previous GSA paper. Uh, also reduce the cell-associated CVDNA in the gut and also replication competent virus in lymph node. And uh, there was no any deleterious effect in using interferon after IL-21, at least for the older market that we measure. And of course, we didn't measure everything. And this also resulted in a significant delay and lower vi viral rebound up to 45 days after heart interruption. And again, it's important to remember that the, the animals are still do treated with interferon. However, plasma viremia increased to levels similar to controls after interruption of the interferon treatment. So we, we think that while at n reduced inflammation, the addition of interferon resulted in a more effective control in viral rebound and a more stronger anti-reservoir impact. And uh, we hope that we can uh, play with the synergy of this such intervention to have a stronger reduction of the SAB reservoir. So for the second part of the talk, while this first part focuses more on targeting the immune dysfunction, so by reducing inflammation, the increase in the antiviral immune response, we are now presenting data that are more focused on trying to understand what is the cellular and uh, anatomic nature of the reservoir, so where the virus persists in these SV infected rhizomacacs. And uh, if we discover that, can we target these cells? And we particularly focus on CD4 memory, CD4 T cells that express co-inhibitor receptor. And uh, I'm not going through all this slide, but there is a, a lot of rationale to think that co-inhibitor receptor are involved in persistence. First of all, these uh, um, co-inhibitor receptors are upregulated in response to activation. So there is the rationale that the cell that is activated, get infected, upregulated several of these co-inhibitor receptors that their job is to bring the cells back to a resting state, so that may favor persistence. And indeed, there's been several studies showing that uh, if you take uh, several of these uh, co-inhibitor receptors upregulated in both CD4 and CD8 T cells during HIV infection, and the cells that express PD-1 have higher HIV DNA content, and the recent paper on nature medicine by J.P. Pantale group showed that in human, the large majority of replication competent virus in the reservoir is in these cells that express in the lymph node, is in these cells that express PD-1 and are in the follicle. And I will be back to that paper later on the talk. And there is also data by Rafik Sekali group showing that cells that express CTLA4, and this is in uh, uh, viremic patients, so no antiretroviral therapy, actually have up to close to 20 times more HIV DNA integrated than the cells that do not express CTLA4. So based on this data, we decide to use our model. So we infect 10, SV, 10 uh, rhizomacacs with SV MAC239. We put the animal on ARF for more than one year, so as long as feasible in the monkey model and for cost. And we then sacrifice the animal on antiretroviral therapy. So we can look at the reservoir in multiple locations. And we focus particularly, as I said, on cells that express PT1 and CTL4. So the data I'm going to show involves cells that express only CTL4, only PD1, both conhibitor receptor or neither of these markers. So, as I said, there is previous data showing that the cells that express PD-1 have high level of HIV DNA content. So, we were quite surprised to find that in multiple anatomic locations where we look, actually cells that express CTLA-4 but not PD-1 here in green have level of HIV DNA, SIV DNA content that are at least equal to the cells that express PD-1 and in some cases even statistically significant higher. And this has been pretty consistent in all the animal and pretty consistent in all the location in which we look at. And this is one example. It's probably one of the most dramatic, more than representative, but again, to show that wherever we look, PBNC, lymph nodes, spleen, gut, and bone marrow, we found a significant amount of SV DNA cells in these uh, um, cells that express uh, CTLA-4, but not PD-1. So it's important to remember that the cells that express CTLA-4 are much less frequent than the cells that express PD-1. So when you calculate the overall contribution to the size of the reservoir, so not only uh, 
the frequency of a specific cells that are SVDNA, but how many of those cells are in your body. Uh, when you do that exercise, what you find is that actually the large majority of the virus come from cells that express PD-1 or PD-1 and CTLA-4 in many locations. And what was of main interest for us is that if you consider cells that express PD-1, uh, CTL-4 or PD-1 and CTL-4, they harbor up to 80-90% of SVDNA in many locations that we look. And the PD-1 and CTL-4 can be targeted as uh, antibodies being developed for cancer. So these cells harbor up to 80-90% of the overall pool of SVDNA. So to summarize this part, we are showing that cells that express CTLA-4 but not PD-1 are enriched in SVDNA on a sub-basis, but that overall the cells that express PD-1 and CTLA-4 contribute the most to the SVDNA pools. We want to try to understand what is the difference for a memory cell in expressing both marker on, and or only CTLA-4. So again, we get on these, uh, uh, on these four cells, so this is cells that express uh, uh, I don't know why, it, I guess it's a C-MAC issue. This is all messed up. But this is a cell that express uh, only PD-1, PD-1 and CTL-4, only CTL-4 or double negative cells. And since the CTL-4 is expressed on t rex cells, we tested how many of these cells have a t rex phenotype. So we stated for being CD25 positive, CD127 negative, and also for expressing FOXP3. And as you can see in the graph showing the lymph node and the PBNC, the large majority of these CTLA4 positive cells, but PD1 negative, are enriched in T regulatory cells. And we have also multiple marker of TREG and also TREG function in the manuscript that I'm not showing now. So regarding the other cells, the ones that express both PD-1 and CTLA-4, they are actually largely T follicular per cells. So, so they have the highest fraction of PD-1 and CXR5, so the classical definition of TFH cells. They actually have even higher level of BCL6, the transcription factor of TFH, than the classical TFH cells. So if we get on TFH based on PD-1 and CXR5, or if you get in these cells that express PD-1 and CTLA-4, they have comparable or even higher level of BCL-6. And similarly for a function, I have one that is a signature cytokine of T follicular per cells, is again higher in the cells that express PD-1 and CTLA-4 as compared to the other subset and equal to the T follicular per cells. So the two main contributors to our persistence are cells that are T-reg-like, the one that express CTLA-4 but not PD-1, or T follicular per cells like the one that express PD-1 and CTLA-4. So one interesting result that came out from this phenotypic analysis is actually that these cells that express CTLA-4 but not PD-1 have a very low level of CXR5. CXR5 is a, an important receptor for cells to, in the lymph node to home to the follicles. And so it was expected that they have less of the PD-1 positive because, as I said, these are largely TFH cells, but they have less level even of the PD-1 negative cells. So based on this data, this data suggests that these TREG-like cells have a much less chance to localize in the follicle than the other cells. And as I said before, there is data showing that the majority of replication competitive virus is indeed in the follicle. So we want, we were interested by this and we um, collaborated with the Jay Kestis at the NCI at the time, now he's at the Oregon Prime Center. And what he has been able to do is basically combine his um, DNA scope technique so he can stay in situ for the SVDNA, here shown in red, with uh, some marker, in this case is CTLA-4 in green or PD-1 in uh, blue. And uh, taking advantage of the monkey model, we stain it in the lymph node longitudinal. So before heart initiation, uh, early heart, and later on, on antiretroviral therapy. And this is a complex slide that I'm going to walk you through. So uh, here, what is Jake is showing is that the frequency of cells that express SVDNA before you start TART that uh, are only CTL4 in green, only PD-1 in black or PD-1 and CTL-4 in blue. 
So the key message is that if you go at pre-art, before you start antiretroviral therapy, you have a lot of SVDNA and only 20% of those cells that express SVDNA in average express one of these coinibid receptors. So virus is in many memory C40 cells, including cells that do not express PD-1 and or CTLA-4. However, if you now come back to the same animal, this is longitudinal, one year after on antiretroviral therapy, now you have significantly less SVDNA because you are on antiretroviral therapy, but the cells that are more SVDNA, and this is in the T cell zone, so we are outside the follicle, are largely the CTLA-4 positive. So there is a decay in the contribution to the reservoir of the cells that are CTLA-4 negative, but there is a more than twofold increase in the contribution of the cells that are CTLA-4 positive. So if you now focus on the B cell follicle, here in the bottom, there is a very similar message. So if you come at pre-art, in average, only 20% of the SVDNA positive cells express one of these markers. But now you go back one year on art, and the large majority, up to 80%, in some animal, 100% of the remaining SVDNA positive cells express PD-1 and the CTLA-4. Indeed, the cells that do not express PD-1 and CTLA-4, they have a five-fold reduction. So they were present at pre art but they are much less frequent on art. So they have a very fast decay. However, the cells that express PD-1 and CTLA-4 increase their contribution more than four times. So together, this data indicate that the contribution of conibit receptor positive cells in the lymph node increase with art is mainly from the follicle. So we are confirming that as a quantity, the large majority of the reservoir is in the follicle on T follicular per cells that also express CTLA-4. But we are also saying that is not everything the follicle because we found a virus outside the follicle in cells that are actually PD-1 negative uh, and that are CTLA-4 positive and Treg like So these cells, for example, will not be targeted by intervention that are targeting only T follicular per cells or only PD-1. So why we think this is important? As I said, there's been a previous study on uh, natural medicine in 2016 showing that in human on antiretroviral therapy, the large majority of the um, HIV transcription and replication competent viruses is on T follicular per cells that express PD-1. And actually, the group has been very um, recognized that this was largely actually an um, active and persistent virus transcription. These cells were also high in HIV RNA. So one thing in those data is that actually the contribution of these T follicular per cells was going down with the length of antiretroviral therapy. So as long... Uh, people who are longer on antiretroviral therapy, the contribution of TFA cells was going down, suggesting that there was also another subset contributing to persistence. And indeed, uh, me and my colleague Matthias Litcherfield were asked to write uh, news and views on this article, and we make that point that the reduced stability of TFA cells may also suggest the presence of another CD40 cell subset that contribute to viral persistence in the lymph node. And at the time, in 2016, we did not know which one was the subset, but I think our data now characterizes that at least an additional subset of cells contributed to viral persistence in the lymph node are these cells that are PD-1 negative. So, as the previous talk point out, everything I showed to you until now is SVDNA content. So majority of that is very likely defective. Since the previous study in human was showing that those P1 positive cells uh, are both replication competent virus, and now we are saying that the PD1 negative, CTL4 positive, are also important. We want also prove, actually the reviewer wants us to prove also that that virus was replication competent. So we have done the QVOA that I'm not going to, to explain because what Brad explained before, but basically it's a co-culture with purified CD4 cells from our animal. And you can see here positive control, cells that express PD-1 and CTL-4, or cells that express only CTL-4. So this is not actually, this is not a quantitative um, uh, say because these are very rare subsets, so there is no way we can sort enough cells. So this was uh, to address the question, do they have replication competent virus, yes or not? We cannot say if they have less, more, or equal to the PD-1 positive cells. What we can say that in six out of seven animals in which we look, we are successfully able to uh, rescue replication competent virus from these PD-1 negative cells. And we also went to the next step. We took the surnatant of this co-culture 
and we then reinfected uh, the feeder cells to prove that the virus was not only replication competent but also uh, infectious. And indeed, we were able to infect very easily four out of four um, from four out of four animals. So this uh, um, reservoir on CTL4 positive PT1 negative cells are both replication competent and infectious virus. Since, as I said, this is all on monkey model, we want also prove that the same reservoir exists in humans. So in collaboration with uh, Vince Marconi, clinician at Temer University, we also collect a lymph node from six HIV infected patients. And uh, two important advantage, one of course is not the model is the human and two being human they've been on earth much longer than our animal in which we treated on earth for one year this was an average of three years but the several of these patients were more than five years and they have an undetected over a year since a long time and again looking the t on we found even more actually stronger than in macaques that the few cells that harbor HIV DNA are largely up to 80 percent expressed in CTL4 but not PD1 and again, as a quantity, there is more in the follicle, but there is also a reservoir outside the follicle. So all this data has been uh, published recently in Immunity in 2017, and I'm not going through this slide, but again, with the previous paper, there's been now many interest in targeting T follicular per cells. There is study aimed to deplete CD20 in the monkey model so that CD80 cells can go inside the follicle. Uh, because that is that if you deplete a B cell, the follicle will be disorganized, and so killing these TFH cells, there is study to target PD-1 because the TFH cells express PD-1. So our point is that it's critical to target the PD-1 positive cells, but uh, those interventions will not touch these cells that we think are also an important contributor of the to do SFV persistence. So where do we go from here? So we... Um, all my talk focuses on the importance of targeting this co-inhibitor receptor on the 40 cells, but of course there is a lot of rational in targeting, and again, we saw this also in the previous talk on CD80 cells, and this is why these antibodies been, are used in uh, cancer to improve the CD80 cell function to recognize uh, cells presenting antigen, viral or cancer antigen. So the overall idea is that uh, by using uh, these uh, P1 and CTL4, inhibitor antibody against this inhibitor receptor, we can have two important results. One, reactive with the virus from these cells that harbor a replication competent virus. And in the meantime, the hope is that we will also improve, as in cancer, the function of CD8 and or NK cells to basically kill these now um, cells that will present an antigen. So we have partnered with the GSK and with the UNC Cura. Um, and they've been creating, generating antibodies. So the issue with the macaques is that if you use human antibody, in particular the PD-1, is very immunogenic. So we give one dose to the animal and they generate the anti-drug antibody, as you saw also from Ron Desrogit talk uh, yesterday, I guess. So they've generated for us macaques antibody, and uh, this uh, antibody has been tested, so we know PK and PD in an infected animal. So this is an example. This is the serum concentration of the antibody, so it's four different doses. And this, we are proving that there is a receptor occupancy. We cannot longer stain for PD-1 on CD4 or CD80 cells because the antibody is now binding PD-1. And this is also to show that actually the antibody is penetrating the tissue. This is lymph node, and again, we have receptor occupancy. This is before we treat the anti-PD-1 antibody, so we can see a good level of T follicular per cells. And after, as you can see, we cannot longer stain for these cells. So these are not depleting antibodies. You see there is a lot of CXR5 positive cells. So the point that I want to make is not that we are depleting TFH, but that the antibody is there and is binding PD-1, so we can no longer standing for it. So based on all this study, we uh, started a new study in which basically we have animals that will, uh, so animals are going to be infected, start of one year of antiretroviral therapy, and in the last month of antiretroviral therapy, they will be treated with co-inhibitor receptors. So we have control, they will receive an irrelevant antibody, and they will be blocked by with only PD-1, we will block only CTL4. We'll combine the two monoclonal antibodies together, so blocking both pathway with two monoclonal antibody, and GSK also generated a bispecific antibody to target both PD-1 and CTL4. 
And uh, the key question is to determine the safety and which impact intervention, if any, has on antiviral responses, SV persistence on art, and SV control post art treatment interruption. So these are long studied. They started like almost two years ago. And uh, we, I still don't have data. The thing that I want to show you is that so we just completed this phase here. So we have been administered the antibody to the animal. So now we are stopping art and following longitudinally. So one thing that is clearly happening is that this antibiotic, this antibody is a biological activity. And I'm showing here the level of CD40 cells proliferation. And this is the control. So one month before, uh, day zero. And if you go later on, basically there is very stable level of proliferation. So this is the one animal that received the CT4 and PD1. So this is again before they received the antibody, and then they started to receive the antibody at the 0, 7, 14, and 21. So here the blood is collected before they received the antibody, so it's still a pre-infusion. As you can see already, one week after we block PD1 and CT4, there is a massive proliferation of CD4 and CD8 cells, more extensive for CD4, but also CD8. So, I have no idea if this is going to be good or bad, because theoretically may be good because we may reactivate the reservoir. Theoretically may be bad because proliferation may expand the reservoir by clonal expansion. So the point is that these antibodies, are, in particular CTL4, are definitely doing what we are expecting, that we are blocking this break on the T cells, and now the T cells are more active, more proliferating. And this is basically those data graphed. So as you can see, the black are the control, very stable level of proliferation. They only are on art. And the animal that receive the antibody, not so much with only PD-1, but when you start to add the CTL-4 in combination with PD-1 as the red or only CTL-4, also the blue, you clearly see a massive increase on CD-4 and uh, less strong, but still very significant proliferation of CD-80 cells. And we are measuring now the antiviral function. We have no uh, data on that yet. So our study will provide, the, I think, one of the first evidence in the, in the monkey model of how co-inhibitor receptor, in particular, combined, may impact on viral persistence. There is also a study by Sharon Lewin and Steve Dix, in which they are basically uh, allowed to collect blood and tissue from cancer and HIV-infected patients that uh, are receiving multiple combination of co-inhibitor receptor. So this is for cancer patients. Again, they're receiving this in the context of cancer, but they will be able to determine if the co-inhibitor receptor has any impact on the size of the reservoir. So in conclusion, as a take-home message, curing HIV infection, we believe is both a virological and immunological problem, and both these two components need to be solved. Artreat, I hope I convince you that our treated HIV infected macaques is now a, a very robust model to test innovative concept and uh, in particular risk intervention to cure um, for HIV infection uh, reservoir research. Uh, we strongly believe that eradication of HIV will most likely require a combined approach because the nature of the reservoir and the nature of the problem is very complicated. And uh, IL-21, at least when administered at initiation, we never did the study later on when the animal already undetected, but at least when administered at initiation, uh, had a big impact in limiting residual inflammation during art. And we believe that combined PD-1 and CTL-4 blockade has the potential to target the key cellular component of the viral reservoir. And we need to see which kind of toxicities may come with, in particular, because it also does a very high level of proliferation that we are inducing. So I would like to thank the, all the members of my lab that have been working with me in this project for, for many years. And um, my connection with Brazil, as you said, is getting stronger, not only for being here, but also for having Sadia that now joined my lab in for like 10 months. And um, the um, Immunity study in which we characterize those cells as a TFA, as a T regulatory cells has been done in a close collaboration with Rafik Sekali and Susan Ribeiro that help us to characterize those cells. And uh, I have strong collaboration with Michael Lederman for, in particular, the FTY 720 study that I did not present today, but he presented yesterday. I want to thank uh, Vince Marconi, the clinician at Emory that helped us with the patient. 
and uh, all the vet staff at uh, Emory University. And both Jay Kerstes and Claire Delage and Jeff Lifson at NCI Frederick. UN Secura, key folks at JSK and NIH and Ampar for support. And thank you for your attention. Hi, great talk. And thank you. Uh, I have a brief question in the first part of your talk regarding the IL-21 treatment. And do you uh, have any information on the T-17 uh, after the IL-22 treatment? Can you repeat if I measure? Uh, so again, so my question is uh, uh, information on the T-17 yeah. cells after the IL-21 treatment in this market. If we measure, yes. So we show that, uh, so the measure of T17 cells is by IL-17 production. Uh, and interferon alpha treatment, I'm sorry. Oh, in interferon treatments. So we did not in the study yet. So we have done two studies previous to that, one in which we treated with IL-21 right away after infection, so there was no art, and the GCI study in which we treated with only IL-21. In both studies, a, a clear impact of IL-21 was on T17 cells. We did not measure directly here, but we see the same reduction in inflammation, but we, we, can, we can measure. And we also look if impact on CD80 cell function, because L21 again has been tested in cancer for that reason. And at least in the context, so when we treated, when we use L21 without antiretroviral therapy, so with a lot of antigen around, uh, IL-21 improve the um, frequency of sedative cells producing perforin and granzyme, including the SAV specific. When we did on antiretroviral therapy, we do not see that impact. So the mechanism seems to be of the reduction of activation seems to be at least largely related to improved gut integrity. Now we also study impact on NK cells, but we don't know yet. Yeah, just add, adding to, to that question, oh, sorry, that's, that's me, Ricardo. So you showed that uh, when you combine IL-21 IL and interferon alpha, you have a delay in the rebound and also a lower set point. Uh, can you speculate about the mechanism for that? Yes, so the... Um it's difficult to speak on the mechanism because unfortunately, for a budget reason, we don't have a group in which the animal uh, stop interfering at heart interruption. So here there is two, two mechanisms. So one, we clearly reduce activation during heart and the size of the reservoir. So to me, that should have impact on viral rebound. So that, I think, is a, a, the first most likely impact. And the second one, in particular for the lower set point, is that I think we are treated with interference. So it's a combination of having a lower size of the reservoir to start with, hopefully a better CD cell function, and we are measuring that because we reduce inflammation. Uh, but we also have uh, antiviral in the system during those six, five, six weeks uh, without antiviral therapy. Can it be the virus? I mean, when you delay the rebound, you have a lower um, uh, reservoir, probably. But when you have a lower set point, uh, in contrast to what we said, that's a very, um, uh, very replicating virus. Very, yeah. So it, it's, it's uh, maybe you're changing the virus after that. Yes, yeah, so we are sequences the virus that rebound. Um, so SAV macrotorinal is a clone virus, so there is not too much diversity because we started at five weeks after infection. So we should have some um, mutation that has been induced in those five weeks, but um, we don't know. So we need to sequence, but we are doing also after heart interruption to see if the virus that rebound was different from the inoculum and different from the virus that we have at pre -art. And what could be the effects of the uh, systemic uh, IL-21 treatment to the ILC compartment in the gut? It's a good point. We actually, I always get that question, we never looked. It's a good point because with the, so we look at TH22 cells that are other cells important for gut integrity in addition to TH17 cells 
and those data are in the GSI paper, we improved TH17 and TH22 cells, we did not see, we did not ch check the ILC component. But it's a good question. Well, Mirko, I was just going to ask you about the interferon story, which is what Ricardo was asking you about too, but I'm going to ask you a little more. Uh, why, why these differential outcomes or with with the same sort of outcome with blocking or adding interferon? What do you think is going on? I guess we, uh, we really don't know. So, so few study at time, so uh, Guido has been treating animal with only interferon. So antiretroviral therapy and only interferon. No impact at all. This is coming on the journal of urology, I think, in the next few weeks. No impact at all on the um, uh, size of the reservoir by both DNA content or um, replication competitive virus. There is no R3 to interruption in the study. The animal has been sacrificed during art. And this was the pegylated interferon but also no negative impact of interference in inflammation or activation. Um, so, you know, then a study by blocking interferon. So I, I think critical is the phase in which you do the intervention. And uh, in our study, I think the beneficial outcome, even if limited, is due to the fact that we use in a context in which we already lower the inflammation. So we make, I think, uh, the system in a situation was easier for interferon to basically maximize the potential antiviral or anti-reservoir impact. But uh, again, we don't have a group that has been treated with only interferon or alternative interferon without treating later on. So it's difficult to, to comment to that. And for the humanized mice, you're right, they block interference, they have an impact. Uh, I want to also say that the artery was very short because you know, humanized mice have a short uh, life. And the impact was for a week in the delay, but then there was no more impact at all in the set point viral load. Um, so I think it's still a really a, an open question. We have looked at some co infect patients with interferon riba. And we saw some hypermutation in HIV, and we thought that was briber. But maybe it's interferon, we don't know. So, hypermutation after the interferon treatment. Okay. Were those viruses but, but interferon? Riba, riba, riba okay. Yeah. R Ricardo, were those viruses that you got interferon more interferon resistant in vitro? Or? We didn't even look at that. We just they looked at the HIV after treatment. Okay. Thank you.